Good morning, everyone. I'm Bailey Howard Leonard. I'm a board member with the Permian Basin Adult Literacy Center, and I would like to thank you for joining our live author stream with John Messenger, and a big thank you to Southwest 66 Credit Union for sponsoring our 2021 live streams. Hi, John. How are you? Great. That's great. Thanks so much for having me. So I'm, I'm very excited to talk to you. Uh, introduce yourself and tell our viewers a little bit about you. Uh, so my name is John Messenger. I, uh, I'm originally a displaced Brit, um, but I've been in the United States for quite some time. You can tell from my accent. Um, I got started writing. Uh, actually, I was an active duty officer in the Army and uh, was in Iraq and, and had a good story idea. And with my downtime, I started writing my first book. Um, and that was back in 2007. And it was really something I fell in love with. So I've been writing ever since. And I just uh, put out my 12th book and finishing my 13th book right now. That's so exciting. Uh, so as you know, adult literacy is our primary focus. Why is adult literacy an important topic for you? I mean, I think it's a very loaded question when you ask an author why adult literacy is so important. Um, but I, I think that it's, it's a couple different aspects. The first one being that adult literacy really helps with the opportunities that open up for you. Um, the more literate you are, the more ability, capabilities you have, the more opportunities you have in the workplace. Um, but beyond that, from the author's standpoint, there's a couple real aspects that I love about literacy and literature in whole. Um, the first one being that we are coming through a global pandemic. We've been in quarantine. Literature is escapism. The ability to take a book and disappear from the real world for a while and enjoy the book that you're reading and whatever world that author's created, that's such a highlight. Um, but on the other side, uh, for hundreds of years, literature has been inspiration. Um, so much of modern technology has been inspired by the science fiction authors of the past hundred years. You know, the designs for our submarines are come about because Jules Verne gave us a blueprint for them. The military incorporates technology into its body armor and helmets and everything else because Robert Heinlein gave us the, gave us the uh, the ideas. Um, we're getting ready to make all these these attempts to go to Mars, and we already know that we can survive because Andy Weir told us that it's okay. So I think that uh, um, being able to read, being able to enjoy these stories, it really lights that spark of inspiration, um, and it shows you these amazing worlds. They may not be utopias, but they definitely show you that there's an opportunity for something better out there. Absolutely. So you mentioned that you started writing in 2007. Was that mm -hmm. something that you always wanted to do and you just happened to have the time or it just it just hit you all of a sudden, hey, this is what I'm going to do? Uh, so I've always been a storyteller. Like that's just always been my thing since I was very young. Um, and it wasn't until college that I had someone kind of inspire me and tell me that, hey, you should actually take some of these stories and start writing them. And I did. Uh, in 2001, I started writing a book. Um, I made it about halfway through before some other real life stuff came up and I shelved it. Uh, and I went back and read it and realized how genuinely awful it was. Um, so I didn't really pick up the idea of writing again until 2007. And again, I just happened to be with a great group of friends um, who enjoyed the stories I was telling. Uh, and because we had such a captive audience there while we were deployed, it was a great opportunity to write a chapter and send it to them and have them review it and give feedback. And that's just kind of how that first book came about. Nice. Uh, so you mentioned you have a pretty interesting day job. I'm curious, how, how do you do it? How do you balance writing? How do you balance your day job? How do you balance being an awesome family man? How do you do it? Uh, it is incredibly hard. Um, I, I am an active duty officer. I've been in the army for 19 years now. Uh, I have a great opportunity next year when I finally retire to just be a full-time writer. Um, and that is my retirement plan. Um, but I'm very lucky to be in that position where I can, where I can afford to do that. Um, but it's difficult. And I think some of the best advice I ever got was set aside about an hour a day and just write. It doesn't have to be good. The, the editing process is where you make it good. But if you can sit down and commit to about an hour a day of writing, then you'd be amazed how quickly you can finish a book. Maybe not a good book. Not a good book. But you started. <laughs> That's really the first step in, in any sort of processes. You have to start the process. Right. Um, okay. So can you tell our viewers a little bit about the book? And I have to preface this by saying I have all of them. <laughs> 
<laughs> sitting with me. Um, so I'm, I'm super obsessed with these books. Uh, can you tell our viewers a little bit about the book? Absolutely. So Magic and Machinery is very quickly and easily described as a Sherlock Holmes story in a world of magic. Um, so there's this, uh, this whole world, it's a fictitious world that I created that's on the brink of its industrial revolution. And about 10 years before the books take place, there's this massive world quake and the Southern continent almost splits in two. And from this rift, creatures of myth start appearing, werewolves and vampires and witches. Um, and so uh, the Northern continent where the original story starts taking place before it eventually will spread out from there. Um, the king decides that magic is an abomination. And so they shut down their borders. They no longer trade with the outside world. And they create an organization called the Royal Inquisitors to go hunt down any reports of magic. And so our main character, Simon Whitlock, along with his uh, apothecary friend, Luther Strong, are uh, a team that, of Royal Inquisitors that go out and hunt down these magics. So within this, this world of magic and machinery, you you have these rich descriptions and you have these immersive worlds. I mean, it's really, I mean, you just dive right in. How did you go about creating the world of magic and machinery? So uh, the magic and machinery world, um, the start of it actually still makes me laugh. I was a, a diehard science fiction fan growing up. Um, when I talk about Heinlein and Jules Verne and Isaac Asimov, those were the people I read religiously when I was growing up. So the first four novels that I wrote were all hard science fiction, out in outer space, space battles, things like that, alien races. And when I started coming up with the idea for Magic and Machinery, it was definitely not a steampunk novel. It was definitely not a magic novel. It was the idea that aliens had come down and using their advanced weapons had cut the United States in half. And there was a character who was living in Los Angeles who his, was separated from his family, who was out in DC, and he was gonna make it across this giant rift through the middle of the United States somehow um, to reunite with his family. Um, and that was kind of the start. I was gonna write this science fiction trilogy. And what happened with it was I started thinking about the implications for the rest of the world. Is the United States the only place that was attacked? Um, was Canada and Mexico involved? Like how, how does this impact the rest of the world? And what I wound up coming up with was this idea, bear in mind that I was coming up with this idea in 2013, 2014. I came up with this idea that Canada would build a wall along the US border and basically stop any of these aliens from coming up into their country. And that was the start of it. And I realized that this was not the right setting. I couldn't figure out how to make this story work. Um, and I was just happened to be reading some uh, Sherlock Holmes and it, I had this flash of inspiration where I decided to change it to a, to a steampunk world and take Canada and make it its own continent, which became Ocker in the novels. And that's uh, the frozen North is where a lot of this takes place. Awesome. Uh, so I want to, can you, can you read some for us? <laughs> Absolutely. I have uh, made the many promises that I will butcher the British accent, but I will do what Perfect. I can here. <laughs> All right, so this, uh, this reading is actually from the beginning of the book um, as we're first getting introduced to Simon and Luther. How much longer is our trip? Simon asked, interrupting his associate from his studies. Luther Strong looked up from his stack of papers on the table and arched an eyebrow. Reaching up, he removed his wireframe glasses and set them on the table atop the strewn papers. Without replying, Luther pulled a handkerchief from his suit pocket and wiped clean the window. He looked over the clean glass, admiring the snow-covered mountains over which they flew. A cold draft washed over him as he leaned closer to the window, and he shivered. He reached up absently and ran his hands through his thick mutton chops that covered both cheeks. You have many virtues, sir, Luther said as he settled back into his plush bench seat. But patience has never been won. We will have a few hours remaining. Simon sighed and sank back into his cushioned chair. He retrieved his pocket watch once more and opened it admiring the face of the woman that stared back at him. How is Miss Dawn? Luther asked. Simon glanced up from his watch. Amazing? Unhappy? Both? She wasn't excited about your newest assignment then. Hardly. She'd prefer I stay at home and settle into an occupation far safer. Luther laughed. I can't imagine you in a safer job, sir. Simon Whitlock, swordsman accountant, doesn't have quite the same appeal. 
Swordsman Accountant sounds like a far more thrilling job than this one has been. Are you certain there'll still be some hours? You could pass the time by resting your eyes. If you don't feel the inclination to sleep, you could pass me your blanket if you have no intention of using it. Simon leaned towards the window and clutched a velvet cord that dangled from the top. With a gentle tug, the thick curtain descended over the pane of glass. Though the room darkened considerably, there was an immediately noticeable difference in temperature. Speaking of assignments, Simon said, leaving the sentence hanging. Luther cleared his throat and retrieved his glasses, placing them on the end of his nose. He lifted a few pages, their surfaces covered with tight and meticulous writing. Setting them aside, he retrieved a folder concealed beneath them. Turning it so Simon could see, he pulled open the front cover, revealing more word-covered pages. The corners of black and white photographs peeked out at Simon from amongst the papers. We receive reports of a supernatural occurrence within the city of Havisham, near the western coast on the edge of White Lake, Luther explained. And the occurrence? Luther looked up from the pages. Werewolves, sir. Simon sighed and shook his head. Werewolves, of course it is. He reached out and brushed aside the papers, revealing a few of the pictures beneath. They were headshots of regional dignitaries whom Simon assumed had filed the reports with the monarchy, the regional governor and Mr. Dossett, Oric, and Tambor. But he found no actual evidence of the reported werewolves. Luther, dear chap, how many of these so-called supernatural occurrences have we investigated? Luther shrugged. Six, seven, let's see, there was the vampire of Dormouth Castle, which turned out to be a political coup. The mischievous pixies, the ravenous hound, and the grand wizard of Templeton. Lest you forget the mummy in the catacombs, Simon added, all debunked as charlatans. He sighed and rested his elbows on the table. When I took this position, I imagined myself as a stalwart defender of the crown, keeping our kingdom safe against the invading magics of the southern continent. Instead, I'm exposing fraudulent wizards who are no more adept at magic than a common circus juggler. Yay, thank you. Thanks. Um, so I, I think I'm gonna have to do a little rereading tonight. Um, so I wanna <laughs> talk about the gorgeous cover art and I'm gonna show it. So before I show it, I will say I have an earlier version of the first book mm -hmm. um, because you and I actually met at a Comic-Con oh, right. um, and I was immediately sold. I gave you 30 seconds, <laughs> tell me what the book's about, sold. So I wanna show in detail these, these gorgeous covers and I want to talk about your illustrator and um, how, what kind of relationship that is like. Uh, so I uh, wound up being very lucky. I was, um, I joined a couple of Facebook pages because I was trying to find a cover artist that really could capture what I had in my head for these, for these characters. Um, and I happened upon a Romanian cover artist. Uh, her name is Amy Chudulescu, um, who is just phenomenal. And her artwork is very, very distinct. Every time I've seen a cover posted that, that was one of hers, even without her posting it, I can automatically know it's her. Um, and I reached out to her. Uh, we had a specific cover artist for the, for the first couple covers. Um, and unfortunately she eventually got out of the business due to family issues. Um, and so Amy wound up picking up the covers for us and she, uh, she did two through four and then went back and redid cover one, which is the one we've been presenting um, as one of the, one of the graphics. Um, and she has just, she's knocked it out of the park. She's done a phenomenal job bringing Maddie and Simon and Luther, um, to life. And that's such a magical thing because art is so hard when you see it in your head and then it's just not what you want. It's such a magical moment when you get exactly what you want out of it. So it's interesting thing about that. Um, one of the things about the characters was, uh, I had been reading a bunch of young adult books around the time that I was starting to work on the series. And I kept running into the same trope, which was the main character would run into the secondary character and there would be some line about, this is the most beautiful person I've ever seen. And I kept thinking, I was like, how realistic is it that you keep running into the most beautiful person you've ever seen? And so I had a challenge with some of my friends that said that I could write characters that were not the traditional beautiful characters um, but still make them interesting because I wanted to write character-driven stories. 
And so when you actually read the description of these characters, Simon has a little pencil thin mustache, which probably looks ridiculous. Um, Luther is only about five, four and has these big thick mutton chops. Um, and then Maddie is actually described because she lives in the tundra um, as her skin being weathered and squinting a lot because of staring at the reflection of the sun. Um, so when, when the original cover artist started working on the book one cover, uh, I had given her this description and she came back with someone that probably looked character accurate for Maddie. And I immediately realized that no one actually wanted to see a character accurate Maddie. Um, and we wound up with this beautiful girl on the cover, um, which kind of defeated the whole purpose of what I was doing. <laughs> Yeah, but you read the books and, and Maddie's, Maddie's pretty tough, right? She is, she, she is. She's pretty awesome. Um, so I, I love this universe. I love the magic and machinery universe. Um, I love the mystery. I love the intrigue. I love the healthy skepticism. So I believe in the Loch Ness Monster, but not Bigfoot. What supernatural phenomenon are you convinced is real? And what are you convinced is not real? Oh, that's tough. Um. I think the easy one, the easy answer is we'll go to the science fiction route and say that I absolutely believe aliens exist. Okay. I, I find it very difficult to believe that we live in this massive, massive, massive universe and we are the only inhabited planet in the entire thing. Um, oh man, that's tough. Uh, I like to approach everything with a little bit of skepticism, but a little bit of a believer mentality too. Um, I'm the type of guy that uh, if you find that weird circle of rocks, you just kind of leave it alone and walk around it. Um, I know the logical part of my head says that's not a fairy circle and it's totally fine and nothing's gonna happen. But there's always that voice in the back of my head going, "What if? maybe you shouldn't step in that. Maybe don't. <laughs> okay, okay. I still don't believe that Bigfoot is real. I don't, I don't <laughs> think that that's a real thing. Maybe he's just blurry. He's not just, he just doesn't exist. Okay. Loch Ness monster. Yes. Bigfoot. No. Uh, so let's, let's talk about the, the steampunk aspect of it. Where did that come from? Are you super into steampunk in your real life? How did you do the research for that? You know, crazy enough, I wasn't necessarily a huge steampunk reader um, before I started working on this. Um, I just love the Victorian era but I wanted to make something more of it. I, I knew that I wanted to have the setting to be this you know, industrial revolution time period. So late 1800s, early 1900s time period. Um, and I wanted to make it familiar enough that someone could pick up the book and even though it's a fictitious world, have something they could relate to. So you can pick up the book and still say, okay, this is a Victorian England, even though it's a different continent, it's a different kingdom, everything's changed. It has a lot of unique features to it. It's familiar enough that you can still relate to it. Um, but just the Victorian wasn't enough because I knew I wanted it magic and machinery. I wanted to have these aspects. And as you go along, I won't spoil anything, but as you go along getting into book three, there's a lot more of a machinery aspect thrown into it. Um, and so, yeah, I think steampunk really became the go-to. I had started watching some movies, um, Mortal Instruments, even though it didn't do fantastic in the theaters was just visually stunning and um, just a, uh, but Mortal Engine, sorry, uh, was just yeah. visually visually stunning and just so much inspiration there. And so, yeah, I started delving in and reading, uh, um, reading a lot of steampunk books as well and realized this was the setting that I wanted. So um, I, I love reading, right? We've, we've talked right. about that many times, obviously I love reading. What are you, what are you currently reading? Uh, so, I am currently reading Harry Potter. And that's primarily because I read to my kids every night. And uh, we had just finished one of my other series uh, called the World of Flame series. And I had just finished reading that to my oldest and we decided um, it was time to delve into Harry Potter again. We had tried reading it to him before and we made it to about book four where everything starts getting a little darker. A little darker. And uh, his age at the time wasn't quite ready for Dementors. Um, and so we, we had shelved it. Um, and so we jump back into it and we're, we're rereading that, um, which is kind of good inspiration because I'm also working on a new series, which is a, uh, a Magic Academy series. Can you dive into that a little bit? Yes. So um, I, it's a mid-grade series. So we're talking middle school, middle school kids. Um, and it's this girl who uh, who is, yes, I'm, I'm all over the place, just so you know, genre does not mean anything to me. I was just thinking um, <laughs> I'll still read it, it's fine. Yeah. 
Um, but it's, it's this girl who shows up to a magic academy that her mother had attended, um, searching for her mother who had disappeared, you know, seven years before. And the first thing she realized, she finds out, is that she looks identical to the girl that founded the school 200 years ago. And so everyone is treating her as this chosen one who's supposed to be phenomenal at magic. And she honestly believes that everyone's made a terrible mistake and they're really you're going to regret referring to her as the chosen one. Okay. When can I read that? Uh, so the first book is going to come out in October. Um, the whole setting is based, based, around, is based around Halloween. And so it should be coming out around October 26th. Perfect. Okay, great. So I'm going to keep on the lookout for that. I want to kind of delve back into the writing process. So you already said your advice is write every day, no matter what. Mm -hmm. you're, you're already promoting literacy, you're reading to your kids. How does your military career, this is a question from the viewer, how does your mm -hmm. military service influence your writing? Um, I, I think it's, it's so it's twofold. Um, the first side is just the military side. Uh, a lot of my early books were military science fiction. And so I tried to incorporate as much as I could about tactics, um, about realism. Um, having written them while I was deployed, I felt that I could apply a lot of realism to the battlefield and things like that. Um, but I'm also in the medical field. And so uh, what I've done a lot more with this, with the steampunk series is not as much the military side, but the medical side. Um, he, Simon is also a trained doctor. And so performing autopsies and things like that is totally within his wheelhouse. And so I've tried to apply what I've learned over the past 19 years into something where no matter the background, the reader's gonna pick it up and realize that I've at least done some level of research. Uh, there's some, there's yeah. some level of expertise, yeah. As an author, I am wholeheartedly under the impression that my readers are way smarter than me. And if you don't believe me, go read my reviews. They have pointed out every flaw I have ever made in a book. And you know what? That's great. That's great because I have a firm believer that if you are the smartest person in a room, you're in the wrong room. So I take the feedback to heart. I work on improving. And every book that I put out, I think gets better because of the feedback I get. I love that. That's such. That's a very, very healthy approach to take <laughs> when you are in a profession that criticism just comes naturally. Right. Have you ever had a review though that is just like, it took you a couple of days to, to tie up those bootstraps and get over it? I, I'm i very attached to these characters. Um, I, I didn't expect to get as attached as I was when I started writing about Simon and Luther, Maddie, Javin. And as I started writing these characters, I really just, I really fell in love with the characters and the story and the worst criticism I've received is when someone's like, these characters are dumb. And I'm like, no, they're very, there's depth they're to them. They're very cool. <laughs> yeah. I've met them all. They are incredibly cool. It's, it's tough though, because this is a long series. I'm writing, I'm finishing book five right now, which will come out at the end of this year. Um, but I'm planning it at about 13 books. And when you plan out a series that long, there's a lot of things that, a lot of hints and clues that get dropped as total background noise in early books that come to fruition later on. And so a lot of people complain sometimes about threads that they've seen or they've heard or they read. Um, the Covellian Knights are a prime example. The Covellian Knights are the knighthood that, that basically guards the rift and is supposed to stop the majority of the magical creatures from coming out. And they've been referenced a few times in the books now, but that's all it is. It's just a reference at this time. Are you going to meet him later on? Absolutely, but patience. Right. Patience. I want to. I want to build this world slowly enough that by the time you meet them, you're invested in who they are as well. Um, and sometimes it's tough for readers to not get that instant gratification. Yeah. No. It's it's tough for me right now to only have <laughs> four and know that five is going to be out at the end of the year. Um, I'm gonna have a lot of reading. Uh, right. October and then it like when you say end of the year do you mean like right after the magic academy is going to come out then I'll have the fifth magic and machinery because I'm not complaining if that's the case I am aiming for end of November right now okay if you just want to back to back to back <laughs> like just just shoot them out I would be October 26 happy. October 27 no big deal okay yeah just just and if you wanted to extend it to like 15, 17 <laughs> in the series, I'm, I, I'm good with that. Um, so 
if people want to know more, and I know that they're going to want to, um, where can they find you on the internet, on socials, all that kind of stuff? Um, social media is obviously the easiest place to find me. John Messenger author is, you can search for me on, on Facebook and I pop right up. Um, and then on top of that, uh, I've got an author page as well, johnmessengerauthor.com, um, which uh, of course has links to all the books as well. And you can purchase them off Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we will post those links so that everybody can can see them. Um, thank you. I this Thanks is so much. I'm obviously like a, a huge huge <laughs> fan of these books. Um, I'm a huge fan of you as a person. I knew that you were special when I met you at that comic con. I was like, these are going to be great. These <laughs> books are going to be really great. Um, anything else that our I I didn't ask that our viewers need to know? Uh, no, I mean I, I'm. I'm such an advocate of, of adult literacy. I think that once you start cracking open books and diving into these worlds, you realize that a whole universe exists that you didn't even realize existed. Um, I talk about world building all the time. I talk about my favorites like Dune, which uh, is such a rich world, but has so much backstory that you'll never see. Those are the types of books you wanna find. Those are the type of books you wanna delve into to find out just how deep and, and rich and beautiful these universes can be that these writers create. Yeah, I, you know, I read a ton and that's for me, it's like the real world is we all have to deal with it, but at the end of the day, you can just sit back and relax and just take a little vacation, take a little vacation. Right. Even if you can't get physically away, take a little mm -hmm. vacay in a book. Um, I want to thank John Messenger for joining us today. Uh, please check out his website. We will link it. You can buy the books on Barnes & Noble. You can buy them on Amazon. Um, and I just want to thank Southwest 66 Credit Union again for making all of this possible. And I would like to remind all of our viewers um, about the Permian Basin Adult Literacy Center's Readathon happening now until September. And we would love for you to consider uh, sponsoring a student. Thank you for joining us today. All right. Thanks so much.